the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, French wheeled cavalry, round study, late large caliber rockets, and metal beasts, the international hunter. It's been a long time since the Metal Beasts section featured a vehicle that you can receive by simply playing in a squadron. And there's some very interesting machines to unlock there. The latest new vehicle from this category certainly deserves your attention. Please welcome the Hunter F-58, a Swiss plane made by the British and found in the German tech tree. The aircraft is propelled by a turbojet engine. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the wing and the fuselage. You can also add a couple drop tanks. Under the cockpit, we can see a group of four 30mm autocannons. While the hardpoints can carry conventional bombs and rockets of various calibers, as well as air-to-air -air and air-to-surface guided missiles. Let's discuss air combat first. The first member of the Hunter family has long enjoyed its position among the top fighters alongside MiGs and Sabres, so War Thunder veterans should be familiar with it. However, much has changed since then. Nowadays, it regularly meets more modern opponents with afterburners who can easily go supersonic. Actually, it's more than just fighters. Even strike aircraft are now a huge threat thanks to all aspect missiles. Still, the Hunter can stand its ground well enough. Yes, it's far from being the fastest or the most maneuverable aircraft, but it can retain its speed in a turn better than most. Thanks to that, this Swiss fighter can exit a dogfight and speed away at any time. One of the main advantages that the Hunter enjoys in air combat is its armament. 30mm autocannons have always been a big issue for anyone within their range. By the way, the British top fighter had even been the record holder for the highest one-second burst mass. Today's Metal Beast, however, can also carry a couple of air-to-air -air missiles. They're not all aspect ones, sure, but the rest of their characteristics are similar to what later fighters can carry. Moreover, few of the Hunter's opponents can use flares at this BR, so evading its attacks would be tricky. Meanwhile, the F-58 itself isn't afraid of enemy missiles thanks to the 60 flares it can carry. The new Hunter's key asset, however, is used in CAS instead of air duels. Its predecessors could only carry conventional bombs and rockets if they wanted to attack ground targets. The squad version, on the other hand, can also use the AGM-65 Maverick guided missiles. Yes, the limit is only two pieces, but at such a low BR, this weapon is terrible news for any anti-air vehicle. And that's all we wanted to say about this new member of the squadron vehicle family. French tanks made in the 1930s couldn't boast great design solutions. Their armored cars, however, did much better. There was a reason for this situation. Similar to other nations, the French infantry and cavalry commissioned their vehicles separately. The former held on to the old World War I ideas, and their infantry tanks were slow and mostly blind. Commanders sat in single-seat turrets, often getting overloaded and unable to follow the course of battle. The Germans noted that it made French tanks way too slow to react to danger, which led to them becoming easy targets. The cavalry chose a different way, and history proved them right. Their manufacturing orders saved the reputation of the French engineers and military. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. At first, the cavalry only ordered small batches of armored cars. They needed some reliable mobile vehicles while early tanks were slow and broke down too often. Everything changed by 1930, when the French cavalry got down to motorization in earnest. They ordered three types of armored vehicles, AMC multi-role carriers, AMD reconnaissance vehicles, and the AMR skirmisher vehicles. The task didn't specify if they had to have a wheeled or tracked base. The cavalry expected the manufacturers to propose their own ideas, so that later they would choose the best offer. For some reason, Two out of the three roles were filled with the less than stellar tracked AMC-34 and AMR-35 tanks. 
The recon roll, however, was to be performed by the Panar 178 armored car, also known as the AMD-35. The cavalry hit the jackpot with it. By the mid-1930s, it was the best machine in its class. The Panar had a two-seat turret with an electric drive, which was a unique case for a French vehicle. Moreover, it had a great 25mm cannon. It could use armor-piercing rounds with a muzzle velocity of 950 meters per second, effectively turning any German tank into a strainer. Its frontal armor reached a thickness of 26 millimeters, beating some light tanks. Mobility was also decent, with a top speed of 72 kilometers an hour. It even had two drivers. The rear seat made it possible to move and reverse with the same speed as forward. Basically, it was a true wheeled tank. In 1939, the Panar could have received a 47mm cannon, but those were in poor supply, so the project had to be paused. The French only remembered about it a couple months before their surrender and sent Renault an urgent order. The company managed to design a new turret in only 48 hours. Still, even with such haste, the French only had time to build a single tank destroyer, which was promptly lost in battle. They did use the experience later, though. After their defeat, the French improved the turret and rearmed around three dozen Panars. Unfortunately, those machines fell into the hands of the Germans. Ironically, they were the ones who uncovered the full potential of the French tanks. The subpar AMR-35 were simply discounted, while the Panars found good use in reconnaissance even in 1943. A year later, Paris was liberated and the French resumed their armored car production. The 47mm versions of these machines served all the way into the mid-1960s. No other pre-war French tank can boast such a long service life. Not long ago, we compared World War II-era rockets. Today, we'd like to check what later models can do. Rockets primarily found under the wings of top-tier aircraft, large caliber ones with heat and high-explosive warheads. Same as before, we don't want to award places to the ordnance, since too much depends on the carrier's performance. What we'd like to focus on is giving you a good understanding of what these rockets can do. Let's get started. Today's competition features the following rockets. The American 127mm Zuni, the Soviet 122mm S-13 and 420mm S-25 O, the Chinese 130mm Type 130, and the Swedish 135mm M-70. The S-25 kinda looks like an adult in a nursery here, of course, but we simply can't avoid it in this discussion, and there's no competition available. We think it'll be a good demonstration of how powerful a rocket can be. For targets, we've picked the British Challenger 2 TES with ERA blocks, an Italian Centauro, and a German truck-based anti-aircraft gun. Naturally, all our participants handle the lightest target with no sweat. No direct hit is required to damage the truck. Moreover, there's enough explosives in modern rockets to allow aiming a couple meters off target. The S-25 O expectedly stands out the most here. Its explosive mass is equal to all the other rockets combined. Unsurprisingly, it can destroy light vehicles like anti-aircraft guns, even if it lands a few hull lengths away. Now, the wheeled tank test produces a different result. It requires significantly more precision, but unlike the SPAAG, the Chintaro isn't sending any missiles back at you. So spending a little more time on aiming shouldn't be an issue. The heavy challengers, well, present quite a bit more of a challenge. Most of our rockets need to score a direct hit or at least land next to the tracks to damage the MBT. The S-25 is an exception once again. It only needs to drop somewhere nearby. But let's focus on the other participants. All of them can knock out the target if they hit it right in the roof. But that's pretty expected, right? Meanwhile, when the rockets hit the thickest places like the turret cheek or areas covered with ERA blocks, the MBT might well survive the hit. It's very likely to lose its combat capabilities after the hit, requiring repairs, but 
it'll live. This might sound counterintuitive, but placing a rocket somewhere under the tank, next to the tracks, is a more reliable tactic than aiming straight at it. And the best option against any MBT is aiming for the turret rear. It's poorly armored and too close to the combat compartment. One final piece of advice. Remember about the performance of your carrier when you use missiles. Sure, top-tier jets have ballistic computers to help you lay your ordnance right, but it won't save you from crashing into the ground. Let's give our aircraft some time to reload while we answer some of the questions you left under our previous episodes. The first question was sent by a player called Sean Channel. Will there be a tutorial on helicopters? Like takeoff, landings, and weapons? Hi, Sean. You can find the video you're looking for on our official website in tutorials. Adicio Dwipi asks, I was just wondering, what's the function of the tube on the rear of the T-64 turret? Hi there. This pipe is called a snorkel. It's used for air breathing when a tank is wading across a river or other water obstacle. Another question comes from Liam Bell. Are you guys going to do a triathlon among the last piston-engined fighters? Hello, Liam. We actually did it quite a while ago, in episode 233. Check it out. It's still relevant. Crust writes, What are the differences between the Lancaster B Mark I and Mark III? Which should I play? Hi, Crust. The difference is found in the rear turret. The later version has a couple of large caliber machine guns, so it's a bit more efficient. And the last comment for today was written by Optimistic. Which is better, the mouse or the T-95? Hey there, Optimistic. It wouldn't be right to compare machines so different, but if we made them fight each other, the mouse is more likely to win. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to let your mouse out of its hanger once in a while. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.